All right, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Um, we left off last week in verse 29 of chapter 34, and Moshe is on the mountain. He's he's getting the instructions again from the Father. He says in tw verse 27, it says, "Then Yahuwah said to Moshe, write these words." For according to the tenor of these words, I have made my covenant with you and with Israel. So he was there with Yahuwah 40 days, 40 nights. He neither ate bread nor drank water. And he wrote on the tablets, the words of the covenant, the 10 commandments. So we see here, this is the covenant renewed. He's, he's writing it on new tablets. Moshe is about to go down the mountain. And as we get into verse 29, we see him come down and we see the effects of it. So we'll pick up um, in verse 29. We'll read from verse 29, finish the chapter in verse to verse 35. So who would like to read first? And for all of those newcomers, when whoever reads gets the opportunity to first reflect on what they see um or what stands out to them and then we discuss it so um verse 29 or verse 35 who wants to go first all right sister poppy 29 to 35 yes okay and it came to be when moshe came down from Mount Sinai, while the two tablets of the witness were in Moshe's hand when he came down from the mountain that Moshe did not know that the skin of his face shone since he had spoken with him. And Aharon and all the children of Yashorel looked at Moshe and saw the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moshe called out to them and Aharon at the rulers of the con and all the rulers of the congregation returned to him and Moshe spoke to them. And afterward, all the children of Yashorel came near and he commanded them that commanded them all that Yahuwah had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. And when Moshe ended speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But whenever Moshe went in before Yahuwah to speak with him, he would remove the veil until he came out. And when he came out, he spoke to the children of Israel that he had been, what he had been commanded. And the children of Israel would see the face of Moshe that the skin of Moshe's face shone and Moshe would put the veil on his face again until he went in to speak with him. I wanna look at some words, but um, the veil he put on his face. I wanna look into that a little bit. So can we come back to me? Sure, sure, sure. Okay. Um, so, so Moshe goes up. And we know that he's receiving, you know, instruction. It says he goes back up. So he's up there 40 days, 40 nights. It tells us he goes up without food or drink. Um, and we know that the body requires at least something to drink. I mean, it just goes to show how Yahuwah was for him all that he needed. You know, he gave him instruction. He was his food. He was his water. In in Yah's presence, we receive all things. So, so very good uh, thing to take from that. But he comes down, and his skin is shining. He he is showing the effects of being in Yah's presence. So, what else do we see there? Anyone? Go ahead, Jim. I was thinking about um, that veil since Poppy mentioned that, and I, I'm wondering if it was because his skin was shining so bright that he was kind of doing it to just um, diminish, uh, not diminish, but to, to tone down <laughs> the brightness 
so so he wasn't glowing. I mean, I don't. I'm, yeah, I'm absolutely. So it was it was Yah's glory that he was veiling because they couldn't look upon it. Because we see, um, I'm sorry, we see um, in Second Corinthians, uh, Shaul makes reference to this very very instance, and he talks about the veil um, being the separation between Yah and his people, and how the veil is removed when we see Yahushua that he becomes our intermediary. He becomes our connection to Yah. He comes in the very image of Yah, and we now have direct access, the veil um, showing the, the, the separation between Yah and man in his presence um, and how his glory had to be concealed uh, as we see. Um, Sister Poppy, is your hand raised again or still raised from before? Again, sorry. Okay, go ahead. Um, I was looking up the letter for, or the word for where it says it's face shown. Mm -hmm. It says, and the definition in Strong's is to shine, to send out rays, to display or grow horns or be horned. I, to display or say that again? To display or grow horns, be horned, like he had, like, and it, it comes from a primitive root to push or gore, used only as denominative from H7161 to shoot out horns, figuratively, raise, have horns, shine. So I'm a little confused. Well, sometimes sometimes the words have secondary meanings, um, so it is important to understand the context of what you're reading to apply those meanings. Um, you'll see that where the word, you know, the same word is used and has a different context around it and could mean that secondary meaning here. Um, it is a reflection that is being, that is blinding uh, the face of the Israelites his veil had to be placed so that it could block um, the glory. That was, it, was, it was a reflection <laughs> from Yah onto Moshe that had to be veiled. You know, um, I believe, I think in Revelation, it, it tells us that we are clothed with his light. I believe that Adam and Eve, when they were created, had light. And when they sinned, that light was removed, that clothing was removed and they could see their nakedness. Um, and we are in that state, we are in that condition. And we will once again, at the end, have that same light that was on Yahushua Messiah. So um, that's what I see there. Anyone else? Uh, right there, right? Yes. Uh... Talking about the, the veil, uh, I think uh, the veil really represents here, uh, the covering of the braille here uh, represents the, the separation between Yahuwah and uh, the people at, this ti at that time. Absolutely. And yeah. the, the, the shining face of Moses representing the how the, the high esteem of Yahuwah, you know, reflecting on him. And the covering there uh, is also uh, talking about the, the face of Moses, you know, that is uh, causing impact to the people of Israel seeing him uh, with, with a shining face. So that's why Mo Moses covered his face again when he was talking to the people of Israel. But I'd like to also emphasize what you have uh, cited already from Second Corinthians chapter three. Yes. Uh, in in verse fifteen, uh, rather verse fourteen, three fourteen. But their minds were hardened, for to this day, when the old covenant is being read, that same veil remains, not lifted, because of because in Messiah, it is taken away. But to this day, when Mose is being read, a veil lies on their heart, and one turns, and when one turns to Adon, the veil is taken away. 
Now Yahuwah is the Ruah. And where the Ruah of Yahuwah is there is freedom. And we are all and we all as with unveiled faces we see as in a mirror the esteem of Yahuwah are being transformed into the same likeness from the steam to steam as from Yahuwah the Ruah. So I think the 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 glory here the the uh, the glory is shining in us uh, become a reality when when we all know ya yahuwah through the son yahusha and uh, but the one that will hinder it is the the hardness of our heart if our heart is not yet circumcised by the ruah then there is the hindrance of showing that uh, that, that glory so i think that's the lesson i'm bringing out here absolutely uh, we are thinking we are, we are reflecting like a mirror. We reflect the, the glory of the Father through the Son. Absolutely. Very good. Very good explanation, brother. I, I appreciate that. I think um, I think one of the things that we looked at a couple weeks ago, when we were going through the book of Isaiah, we were looking at um, the prophecy, but we were also looking at what the contemporary fulfillment was, and we looked at it being um, the son of Isaiah, Mahir Shallow High Spots, as it tells us in chapter eight. But in the second part of that um, passage, in that prophecy, it talks about a later fulfillment in that same time period. And people were, were saying that it was different. You know, this was now Hezekiah. You know, so we looked at Hezekiah and we looked at his life and we looked at seeing this could not have possibly be him. I'm not going to go into that. But one of the things that Hezekiah had the opportunity to do was show the glory of Yah. He didn't show the glory of Yah. He didn't take them to the temple. He didn't show them the Ark of the Covenant. What did he do? He showed them the riches. He showed them what men's glory is, what men marvels at, right? And when he did that, it sparked something in their hearts to want to take it, to want to steal it. So Yah is telling us, no, the light that reflects has to be mine. It can't be yours. You can't take what I give you and turn it into something that draws people to you. It has to draw people to me. Praise Yah. Yeah. You know, so we have to always do that. You know, we have to deflect anything that comes to us. I, there's no great man. Man is great because of the presence of Yah. And the man that's, that's so-called great because of the presence of Yah will never take the greatness. He'll always point it back to Yah and said, without you, as David says, I am nothing. You know, me without the Ruach is, is, is a dastardly man, you know, capable of all things under the sun. With the spirit of Yah, my heart only sees what he sees. My eyes, my mouth, my ears, you know, we become his, we reflect his glory. So I really appreciated Praise your Yah. breakdown of um, Second Praise Corinthians Yah. because Praise that is the picture of what is drawn here in Exodus and is what the Father wants us to see because of it. Thank you. Um, Praise Yah. Praise Yah. Um, Sister June. Did you call on me? You had your hand raised. Oh, uh, I couldn't hear it cut out. I don't know. Okay. Um, yeah, praise Yah. I was thinking of, um, I was, as you were, both you and Danny were speaking, I was reminded of Matthew 5, 16, let your light shine before men. You know, we have that light on the inside. And, um, and I was also curious about that horns. And I looked up that word. It's used four times in uh, in the in the Bible. And three times it means shine. And that fourth time it's it's a scripture in in Psalms and it actually means horns. It says, This also shall please Yah better than an ox or bullock that that hath horns and hoofs so that was really interesting but the other three verses uh actually say sh shown um 
That was interesting. Yeah, that's a perfect example of 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 a word meaning something different in its you know more than one definition in its context. So you you have to see the context of what it's in to understand what it means. Um, that's why sometimes it has more than one meaning. You could, same thing happens with English. A word can mean two different things based upon the context that it's used in. Raise your Anything else there? Raise your Raise your All right, let's, let's move on. So, so I already expressed to you guys that, you know, from, from here on out, it's a regurgitation of what was already given to us. Uh, or should I say what was already given to the children, uh, to, to, to Moshe to give to the children of Israel. Here, from verse 35 on, he's actually giving it to them. So before we saw Yah giving it to him, saying, give this to the people, tell this to the people. Here, from verse 35 to the end of, end of the chapter, well, from first chapter 35 to chapter 40, he's actually telling them what Yahuwah told them. So We'll kind of read through. We'll stop and slow down. Um, I'll start off reading. Somebody else can read later. Um, if you guys are okay with that, and we'll just kind of explain it through. Um, verse chapter 35 says, uh, Then Moshe gathered all the congregation of the children of Israel together and said to them, These are the words which Yahuwah has commanded you to do. Work shall not be done for six days, but the seventh day shall be a holy day, set apart day for you, a Sabbath of rest to Yahuwah. Whoever does any work on it shall be put to death. You shall kindle no fire throughout your dwellings on the Sabbath day. So this is one of those times where we need to stop because we need to see what this is talking about. So. So I just, just want to hear what you guys see here um, with what I just read, because it's very important that we don't mix this up or mess this up because JP's laughing because he knows this this is taken out of context. It's used incorrectly. Um, people are doing things or not doing things because they think is what it says. They're not seeing the context of it. And you got all of these different things that people are doing or not doing on the Sabbath day. So. So let's let's talk about it. So Victoria's hand went up first. What you got, my sister? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes ma'am. Hi. Uh, I just wanted to clarify something where it says, do not kindle a fire in any of your dwellings on the Shabbat day. Mm -hmm. Now, if you live in Alaska and it's 90 below, um, I don't know if it actually goes that low. Can you, if you, all you have is a wood burning fireplace, can you use it? And I've also heard uh, people that we refer to as Jews say that you can't even uh, flip on a light switch or right. start an engine. So I, I would really like to hear Absolutely. you elder to see what your perception is about all of that. that Thank is you. A, that question is exactly why I stopped here because um, the the view of this is is looked at as being separate from what it says prior to it, and there's a context here that we have to see, right? So, and I, I just want to hear anybody else what they have to say, and then we'll we'll go into it. We'll get into it. So, Rick and JP don't say anything. You talk. You guys talk later. Uh, <laughs> everybody else, I want to hear what you guys have to say, and then you know I'll let the other brothers speak. I just want to, and, and the reason I'm doing that is because I want to, you know, it's important to, 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 to say what we see, to say what we think even, you know, so that it can be either corrected or can be discussed, right? So that we have a clear view of this. So, so that's all I'm doing. I just want to see what you guys think um, that you're reading here. Go ahead, Sister Poppy. My understanding of that verse is that it um, has more to do with causing offense or upsetting somebody or doing something that's going to anger somebody or um, just like attacking, getting in an argument. 
or what have you, that kind of thing, something that's going to make someone else burn kind of, that's my understanding. Right. So, so when you look at it that way, though, you're, you're taking away the literal meaning and you're only seeing something metaphorically or, or you're only seeing something uh, visually or pictorially or what's the other word? Um, I forgot the other word, but, but it, remember, in reading scripture and understanding scripture, it first has to mean something in the context that it's in, and then it can have either a future meaning, something looking forward, a prophetical meaning, or even an allegorical meaning or, 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 or a metaphor. But it has to mean something within the context of what Yahuwah is saying to the people here. Um, so we have to see that first. I'm not saying it couldn't also mean that it could, um, because we don't want to be burning towards someone else, angry with someone else on the Sabbath day. But here it means something literal, and I want to make sure, sure we get to the bottom of that. Sister Nisha, I saw your hand go up. What you got to say, sis? Trying to hide. Shalom. Um, I, I was kind of with Sister Poppy and on the the more spiritual aspect, I was looking at the the words in the Abrit, Ba'ar, Ash. And so, um, you know, I was leaning towards the, the more spiritual concept of not kindling a fire towards Yahuwah um, or your brother. Like the literal aspect would be kindling a fire towards your, your fellow brother, those that habitate with you in your, in your tent. Um, nor kindling a fire with Yatwa, more importantly. Interesting. Very, very good. Very good way to look at that as well. Um, anybody else before I let JP and uh, Rick go? The, the scholars. Uh oh. See, I forgot about Sister Diane. She's a. Uh, <laughs> well, I am certainly not a scholar, but I had a question. Sure. Uh, you, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, please, because I thought you and I had a conversation on this. It was probably a couple years ago at this point, mm -hmm. but you had said something about the, the kindling from a phys, phys, physical aspect of the uh, scripture that the burning of the fire was something that they did back then to initiate their work or something to that effect? All right, yeah, well, you're jumping ahead to, to, to yes. Oh. Yeah, we, you, okay. you, you, you and I did have this discussion and that leans to that because it pulls it back into the context. You kind of spilled the beans a little bit, but uh, go ahead, um, Sister Diane. Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom family, my beautiful, beautiful, uh, sisters and brothers, uh, I'm going to keep this very short because I really want to hear what's going forth. And Ben and I uh, didn't do any study on it, but um, I have understood it because different people have different opinions, as we see. Um, but I understand that to me, while they're building the sanctuary, you know, while they're in the process of building and working, towards the goal of putting the sanctuary together that they are not supposed to kindle the fire because um, they, yeah, they had to go out and collect whatever was necessary. And uh, yeah, rest, he wanted them to rest. Don't, 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 don't do this construction day. You know, I want you to take a rest and just ponder and think on me, you know, and not and, and not the project. So, um, praise y'all. I just leave it at that. Praise y'all. Praise y'all. We're getting warmer. Yes, yes, ma'am. We're getting warmer. Um, Sister Yoni. Yoni. Hi. Um, so I was thinking also of the um, the process that they had to go through to collect sticks, to <laughs> bake a cake. You have to do all these processes. And right. that was yet what Yah was trying to deter them from, like, that's why he said, um, I think it was in um, Exodus 16, with the yeah. same thing with the manor. He tell them, go the day before, pick up double 
-hmm. and then bake what you have to bake for the following day. So I, I'm thinking about the the work mm -hmm. before getting the end product. The preparation. See, 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 y'all don't need me to break this down deep. Y'all got it. We just take our time, let everybody speak, and we find the truth. But yes, what absolutely. Verse, what, since that was, that, was, was that, brother? Uh, what, what verse was that? That's just unique on the uh, uh, 16 is 1623. Uh, Exodus, yeah, Exodus um 1622 down. Thank you. Yeah. I was actually gonna gonna bring that up because this gets convoluted with food, cooking, you know. Um, so all of those things come into play. But let's keep talking. Let's keep talking a little bit. Um Brother Rick, you wanna share anything, JP? I'm right on point with the sister unique right now. Uh, that was a beautiful verse because it, it connects with the um, numbers chapter 15 when numbers the man's 15, gathering absolutely. the sticks. Yeah. And, yeah, numbers, and so that, numbers that really has been. Uh huh. Yeah, like numbers 32 to 36. Yeah, numbers 15, um, Exodus 16, both are the two passages I was going to go to. Um, but But we first got to deal with the context here. Um, Brother Rick, anything? I was over here looking. Let me get back over here. Okay, gotcha. Now I can see. All right. Um, yeah, I agree with uh, what you guys are saying. Uh, but I like to, I'm breaking this down, what it's saying word for word to try to see if there's other thoughts that could be in this. And looking at all the interlinear, um, it's, it's interesting how they're word a little different. It says uh, in, in, in the format or the order of the words that it's saying them and actually what they're saying. So uh, what I'm seeing here is that it, it's basically, I mean, I'm just going to wait word for word here. So it says uh, not or no. Um, where we usually get kindle, it basically means to burn or co to consume fire. And then where it says throughout your dwellings, it actually means the whole or all. So, uh, and then the, the, uh, the dwellings, interesting, it means a seat, assembly, mm -hmm. dwelling place or dwellers, so when we're gathered together, basically is what I'm seeing here. Um, usually you think about in your home, but I don't know that I'm seeing that here from this is like a when we're gathering together, we're assembling on the Sabbath. So if we're looking at it in the terms of what it's saying there word for word, you know, you, you people like to inject things of what it means, but I think it's right. You know, we're on the Sabbath day, especially when we're assembled together, uh, there should be no burning of or of or consuming a fire, you know. There's because Yahuwah is the all-consuming fire, you know. So if we're gathered together as an assembly, you know, but those other things also pertain that you guys were discussing too. So I just wanted to throw that in there. It's you know, this is sometimes if people want to add words and it changes the whole reflection of the meaning of what it's being said. Like you said, the context is everything. So right, absolutely. Very good, very good. So I want to go back to what um, Sister um, Victoria said, because that's vital to the conversation, because um, she mentioned um, the Jewish people, which follow Kabbalah, which follow um, the Talmud, which have commandments of men have come and taken what Yah has given us and turned it into something completely different. That's where you get the light switch. That's where you get, um, you know, all these other things. That I was reading something that they that they say even if you got to heat your house, that you find somebody that doesn't follow, uh, or it says it's it literally said you find a non-Jewish person to light your stove for you, uh, and then you'll be fine. How does that make sense, you know, within the realm of what Yah is saying, all that dwell here? So I think what's missed here is the context of what's being said. The context of what be, it was what's being said is the word work, all right? It says, 
These are the words which Yahuwah has commanded you to do. Work shall not be done. So remember, we have chapter breaks, we have verse breaks, we have punctuation sometimes that's added for our reading so that we can understand it and break it down. But remember, this is just given to them. These sentences, a lot of times, even though they're separated, are still one thought. The context is still work. Shall not be done for six days. But the seventh day shall be a holy set apart day for you. Okay, so there's something wrong with my audio. You guys hear me? You're in and out. Oh, uh, really? I agree with you, though. We, you know, when you get in the context of this, we've all heard it coming out: Judaism, Messianic movement, whatever it might be. They all, they all want to add these things, light switches, and adding so much to to this that's restrictions. We just heard it. What Yahusha said that they put all of these things, man-made traditions, and they they're like a bondage, on, a yoke on our necks of the people. You know, the, it, it leads them into doing things that he didn't tell them. You know, right. so we gotta, we gotta, that's we gotta pay attention. The legalistic side of things is what causes a lot of things. These Pharisaic, you know, like I said, Kabbalah, all these oral traditions and things that add more to the context of what Yahuwah is really saying. So right. go ahead, brother, ride you back. Right. So, so what? So, so looking at the context of what is going on here, they're going to be building the tabernacle, as Sister Diane said. But also, they the 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 the, the command is to uh, refrain from working, so that anything that requires fire to work should not be done. That's what it's saying here. Now, Unique brought up an interesting interesting point because she went back to Exodus chapter 16 where it specifically says don't boil right why because you boil it the day before so as to have enough for the Sabbath day the same thing with gathering this is all about doing work on the Sabbath it will require you to gather the wood we see in numbers 15 the man went out to gather the wood he was put to death why yeah I said don't work when you're gathering for fire, when you're kindling a fire for work, it is against what Yah is saying. So does that mean you can't have wood ready for your furnace if you have a wood burning stove? Absolutely not. Does that mean you, can, you can't turn on your oven to heat up something that you prepared the day before? Absolutely not, right? Does it mean you can't put two pieces of bread in a toaster on Shabbat morning, right, Darius? You know, so these things are taken out of context because people don't understand what God's saying. Fire that requires work, fire that requires you doing something in preparation for cooking. Like I shouldn't be chopping up onions and slicing beef and uncooked and, you know, creating this big meal that hasn't been already prepared and then cooking it. I should prepare it, do everything that I can the day before. And then if I need to heat it up in a microwave, in a toaster oven, I can do that. Does it mean, I, you know, those people that, 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 that believe that you're not even supposed to turn the furnace on, are they sitting in their house cold on the Sabbath? I guarantee you they're not. Right. We have to keep these things in the context that they're in. They're building. They're working. Everything that they did at this time in this context required fire. It required for them to, to prepare. To, to gather, to do all these things that Yah is saying, I want this day to be simply left for resting. Do not do these things. So just wanted to make sure we saw that in this context because people get real goofy around these things and they're not reading it properly. So praise Yah. Um, I don't know if we're gonna make it to, to chapter 40 today. <laughs> um, Sister Diane, no, Sister Robbie, then Sister Diane. 
but oh, I also wanted to throw in, but metaphorically, it it can you can look at this and say that that fire, you know, in the context of not sinning against your brother or your sister, not allowing the sun to go down on your wrath, not going into the Sabbath day still angry about something that happened the day before, mm-hmm. you know, I think it's very important in marriages. I know, I know if, you know. I know June doesn't always like me using our marriage as an example on on the World Wide Web, but if if we get into something, we try not to, you know, be in that same state of mind going into the Sabbath. It's very important that you not do that. It's very important that you not carry that through. So uh, <laughs> that was real vague, babe. So hope you're okay with that. Uh, <laughs> uh, Sister Robin. Shabbat shalom, Shabbat shalom, family. Yeah, I have a question, Elder Rod, about like if you have a family member that's ill, not feeling well, mm-hmm. would it be considered a good deed on a Sabbath if they need you to prepare them something to eat, to cook something, soothe, you know, scrabble them an egg or something that they need when they're sick, not feeling well? Well, for the sake of for the sake of saving life, I, I would say, you know. Yah has provided a way for us to make sure life gets to preservation. Now, we don't customarily, you know, make habit of, of breaking any law, you know, but there's always provision made for, for, for the hungry. David ate the showbread. Yah said, don't eat the showbread. But it was for the case of them not starving to death, right? Mm-hmm. No. Abusha breaks that down and he shows how the ears of corn uh, in the corners of your field are left for the for the for the traveler that is hungry. Right. Does that mean he's harvesting on that day because he's picking a piece of corn? Right. So we have to make sure that we understand the spirit of the law versus the letter of the law and incorporating, making sure we're not in sin. Right. So absolutely not. Absolutely not. Um Sister Diane, then Sister Poppy. Uh, yes, this is good. Um, indeed, you know, you mentioned uh, the spirit of the law. You know, we really have to discern, to be able to discern um, the difference between um, the two. Because, you know, as you mentioned, Brother Rod, um, Yosha did feed his disciples on on the Sabbath, you know, and because they were hungry, you know, they were famished, they were weak, they needed their strength, and um, and I think what he did when the when the when the Pharisees questioned him about it, he said something to the fact, well, if it's the eighth day, if the eighth day is on the Sabbath, do you not still go ahead and you know? do what is necessary by law to the male children. So we have to know um, what is and, and, and what isn't, you know, through discernment. Um, but what I wanted to say again about this verses two and three, uh, Brother Rod, you know, you were speaking about uh, context and uh, context is everything. Like first you read the verse, see what the verse is talking about. Then you read the chapter to understand what the chapter is talking about. And then you take it from the book and just move out from there. Well, you know, the the thing about chapter 35 is we look and only verses two and three speak of the Sabbath. You know, what can and cannot be done that day. Um, A lot of times when the leader is given instructions or when a job is to be done, they usually give some laws or they lay down the rules and regulations first. They lay down guidelines first before they actually get into the details of what is to be done. And basically, you know, we see in chapter 35 is just that they're there. He's, he's, it's a regurgitation as you mentioned from previous chapters, 16 or whatever, and um, where they're talking about building the tabernacle. 
you know, he, he's, he's, he's repeating this. So all of chapter 35 speaks of uh, bringing in the offering. They needed money, you know, and uh, we see where they stopped them with that even. But everything that was needed for the tabernacle, even the workmen, you know, on over a little bit into uh, the same chapter, it talks about the workmen again. So chapter 35 is not necessarily about um, the, the Sabbath, the Ten Commandments or anything like that. It's the building of the tabernacle, you know, and it starts off with verse four you know, as to what is to be done, what is to be brought in. So what he's laying out is, well, before you, he's laying out some the foundations, you know, some guidelines in the process of doing this. This is what we're going to do. And while we're doing this thing, this is your day of rest. I don't want you out there doing no nothing, you know, in the process of getting this ready. So I just wanted to bring that out again. Um, while looking at this, if you look at the entire chapter and see what the entire chapter is about, then that gives a better understanding um, even of, of what verse three means. You know, we know that um, in the Brit, the Pharisees just, uh, they, they blended their law of Moses with um, the, the oral laws and they put all type of burdens you know, on the people like, uh, I don't know, someone mentioned earlier about spitting or something like this. If you spit and or maybe that was last night with Brother Jadiel, I'm not sure. Yeah, but if you spit the, on the ground. The walls is if you couldn't, you couldn't spit. Right, yeah. Because so, if you do, yeah, if so the wind blows, it'll, it'll, it'll build a furrow in the ground from the spit. Yeah. Line, and then that's plowing, so you're breaking a Sabbath. So yeah, those are all laws. Yeah, and I'm, you know, I mean, yeah. So stuff like that is ludicrous. So, you know, with that being said, um, this chapter is all about building the tabernacle. So, and it's, and it's about being able to follow his rules and guidelines in the process because the, the Sabbath was already established. You know, he's already talked to them about that. And of course, they're eager to build the tabernacle. They brought in so much money, you know, and gold and silver and things. He said, we don't need any more. So they were eager. So I can very well see in terms of human nature, you know, when we get eager and zealous about something, we'll work seven days a week, you know, and, until we get that project done. We'll go 24-7 until we get that project done. But Yahuwah says, no, uh, no, y'all, my children, my babies, I don't want you all to do that. So just let me remind you, um, don't do that on the Sabbath because that is your day of rest. I don't want you working yourself in the ground. You know, this tabernacle will get built. So um, I just wanted to add a little bit more to that. Praise y'all. Yeah, no, absolutely. You, you definitely um, went there. Um, the context is keeping the Sabbath set apart, keeping the Sabbath holy in the midst of what you are about to do. Absolutely. The context of building. That's why the work part is the center of those first three verses, the work, because that's what they're about to do. And that's where we have to see what this is talking about. And, you know, assembly of who we don't, we don't get goofy here with the, uh, misinterpreting scripture as best we can. Um, let's go with Sister Poppy, then Sister JP, and then and then we're going to start reading. Did you say Sister JP? <laughs> I mean, I, I'm flip that around. JP and or Sister Poppy, then JP. Okay, um, in relation to Robbie's question, I'd like to read scripture that I think answers that appropriately. I call those ox in a ditch situations. If somebody is in need that I find out there to help, but Matthew 12, starting at 10, and it says, and see, there was a man having a withered hand and they asked him saying, is it right to heal on the Sabbath? So as to accuse him. And he said to them, what man is there among you who has one sheep? And if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath shall not take hold of it and lift it out. How much more worth is a man than a sheep? So 
It is right to do good on the Sabbath. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, should brought us to clearly see, you know, what was meant and what we should be focused on. Um, and separating Yah from his instructions creates this list of do's and don'ts that, that, that it wasn't meant for. It was meant to show you his holiness. It was meant to show us his heart. It was meant for us to understand when he says, by these two commands, hang all the law and the prophets, everything that the law encapsulates, everything that the prophets is encapsulated when they speak is spoken in these two commands to me, to your fellow man. And I think we have to make sure we always understand that and we don't get lost and goofy. I'll be using that word a lot here. Um, JP? <clears throat> yeah, I just, I, you know, I really appreciate what the sister Diane brought out. It's, it's really similar to what you had said. You know, we, we have to remember that the scriptures, there's no chapters and there's no this. And, you know, we, we have to, and when you do that, and like, like she had brought out, we're talking about a certain situation, especially here. So let's, and like you had brought out too, Brother Rod, in the beginning, you showed like, we're talking about work. And what kind of where and, and then when you get into the context like that, we don't isolate the verse because that's the problem. That verse has been isolated. And then people, they look at you and they're like, nah, you can't have a fire. I'm like, yo, like, wait, like, you know, so, but of course everything comes with understanding, but I really appreciate the way she brought that out because it really brought it in for me as well, including what you had said in the beginning, it, it ties it together to show in context, the situation. I just wanted to share that. Hallelujah. Absolutely. Absolutely. We have to, you know, um, we got to remember how we're supposed to read our Bible, you know, and I think a lot of people forget and they isolate. Remember, we talked about exegesis and eisegesis a couple of weeks ago in, in, the, in the message we did on how to read, study, apply um, scripture. Um, so we have to make sure that we're understanding what's going on that Yah would say this to them. You know, Sister Diane did a very good job of making us see what we're about to hear. She did pull a JP and jump ahead. <laughs> but the point is what she said, it's about working, you know? And we see that in verse two. So, all right, so now we know, <laughs> now we know um, what this is saying. And, you know, I'm glad that we get to, to break these things. And it's important. You know, I like the way we did it too, and just seeing what people had to say because, you know, it it it, it goes into uh, us individually looking at things versus collectively seeing what Scripture says. Because what we want to stay away from is saying what this means to me. We want to we want to always say what does it mean. Period. And once we know what it means, we'll know what it means to each and every one of us, right? Now, there are individual things that we take out of what scripture is saying, but it can't be separated from the context of the sin. So we always got to remember that. Praise God. All right, let's, um, if y'all ready, let's read through. Um, and, you know, obviously not discouraging questions, but a lot of this we went through already. So, um, Let's read through. I'll read through some verses and then somebody else can take over. I'll read through the next two sections, which are going to be talking about the offerings and the articles of the tabernacle. Somebody else can take over. Verse four, chapter 35 says, And Moshe spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which Yahuwah commanded, saying, Take from among you an offering to Yahuwah. Whoever of who, whoever is of a willing heart, very important here, let him bring it as an offering to Yahuwah. Gold, silver, bronze, blue, purple, scarlet, thread, fine linen, and goat's hair, ram skins, dyed red, badger skins, and acacia wood, oil for the light, and spices for the onyx oil, and for the sweet incenses, 
onyx stones and stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate. So he's saying with a willing heart, give freely all that you had. Remember, they took some of this gold that they collected from Egypt, right? And they made the calf with it. But this is what it was meant for. It was meant to build the tabernacle. All, you know, and we're reading here as he says, all who are willing, and we're going to see that word willing a lot. Why? Because he wants people to have a willing heart. He wants people to give willingly by choice, right? He, they're going to give so much that later in chapter 36, he's going to say, stop giving. We have enough, right? So this is the way Yahuwah wants our hearts to be when it comes to these things. Um, Articles of the Tabernacle, verse 10, all who are gifted artisans, and remember we talked about that, they were had a special gift from Yah, a special um, indwelling to perform these special uh, uh, tasks, artisans and seamstress among you shall come and make all that Yahuwah has co commanded. The tabernacle, its tent, its covering, its clasps, its boards, its bars, its pillars, and its sockets, the ark and its poles with the mercy seat and the veil of the covering, the table and the poles, all its utensils, and the showbread, also the lampstand for the light, its utensils, its lamps, and the oil for the light, the incense, uh, the incense altar, its poles, the anointing oil, the sweet, sweet incense, and the screen for the door at the entrance of the tabernacle, the altar of burnt offerings with its bronze grating, its poles, all its utensils, and the laver and its base, the hangings of the courts, its pillars, their sockets, and the screen for the gate of the court, the pegs of the tabernacle, the pegs of the court, their cords, the garments of ministry, the ministering in the in the holy place, the set apart place, the set apart garments for Aaron, the priest, and the garments of his sons to minister as priests. So we see not only all of the things, all of the utensils, all of the uh, 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 material that's needed to do these things, but also the setting apart of Aaron and his sons, who would be the Levites, right? The tabernacle. Um, all right, here we go. Here we go. Let's talk about the giving. It says, verse 20, and all the congregation of the children of Israel departed from the presence of Moses. Then everyone came whose heart was stirred and everyone whose spirit was willing. And they brought Yahuwah's offering for the work of the tabernacle of meeting and its service. And for the set apart garments, they came both men and women, as many as had a willing heart. See that again, willing. And brought earrings and nose rings and rings and necklaces and jewelry of gold. That is every man who made an offering of gold to Yahuwah. And every man with whom was found blue, purple, and scarlet thread, fine linens, goat's hair red skins of rams and badger skins brought them everyone who had offering an offering of silver and bronze brought it to yahuwah and everyone who was found and everyone with whom was found acacia wood for any work of service brought it all the women who were gifted artisans right there's the seamstress spun yarn with their hands and brought what they had spun of blue, purple, and scarlet, and fine linen. All the women whose hearts stirred with wisdom spun yarn of goat's hair. The rulers, and so, so, so here we see all of these things, right? We see all of these things. Everybody has an opportunity. Who has a willing heart to bring some? If I don't have gold, I can bring goat's hair. I can bring fine linen. If I don't know how to, if I don't know how to spin together blue, purple, and scarlet fine linen cloth then I can take and, and be able to use my gift to, to sew together the goat's hair. See, everyone is included. Everything is acceptable to Yah that was required. And all of these people were able to partake 
with a willing heart. The rulers brought onyx stones and the stones to be set in the ephod, right? To, which which the ephod was what the, what the priest would wear and in the breastplate and the spices and oil for the light, for the anointing oil and for the sweet incense. The children of Israel brought a free will offering to Yahuwah, all the men and the women whose hearts were willing to bring material for all kinds of work, which Yahuwah by the hand of Moshe had commanded to be done. So we see clearly all that is entailed, all that is happening, and we see that Yahuwah wants those with a willing heart. He doesn't want those who are begrudging that they got to do this work, who, who want to fight and kick against and don't want to do it the way that he says do it. They want He wants people that are willing and working for him, who have his ruach moving through them to be able to perform these tasks. That's why it says artisans and seamstress. Go ahead, JP. <clears throat> yeah, just wanted to bring out on um, this one thing um, in in 25, I mean, 3523, it says and badger skins. And um, when you go and using the strongest concordance, it'll it'll also say probably from of the foreign derivation, 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 a clean animal with fur, probably a species of animal, uh, uh, <clears throat> antelope. So just want to bring that out, you know, uh, because we know what what animals were clean and unclean, um, I know that there could be a lot of conversation around that. Uh, was it a badger skin or was it uh, some other type of animal? You know, whether it could have been like like James Strong's is bringing out an animal, an antelope, or a deer or something like that. So, because I know that that could be a, a stumbling block for some that may be wanting to say that the, the, the Bible is contradicting itself because, you know, Yahuwah doesn't use. And so we, we just want to leave it with that. But I'm, I, I just want to say that. Shalom. Well, and it's also interesting. It's also important to point out that the, 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 the difference in the, um, the um, separation of the clean and unclean was also for consumption, for eating. So when we see um, animals used for other other things, you know, does it mean that they can't be used for those things? He didn't say, you know, you can't wear a coat with camel's hair because John the Baptist had that on, right? He said you can't eat one. So we got to make sure we're reading it co correctly that way too. Like, you know, me and, me and Darius and I, we have... Um, our hair brushes are are made with agave. Uh, agave. It's a it's it's a hairbrush made of a plant. Um, because it's like a cactus. Use, it's not uh, a cactus. Yeah, cactus. agave is a cactus. Yeah. yeah. So, but we don't because we don't want to use we don't want to put boar's hair on our head. Doesn't mean that you can't. We we just don't want it on our head. But y'all didn't say you can't have a, a hairbrush with boar's head. He said don't eat one. All right, so we got to make those distinctions and we got to understand what our convictions are. Our conviction is I don't want a boar's head on my hair. I don't. Darius doesn't want one either. So he has a agave hairbrush and so do I. I even bought one for June. So the point here is, you know, to make sure that we're staying in the context. But I like what you said, JP, because we have to understand what that word means. Because we also saw when we went through the different stones how what it said here in our English translations didn't necessarily mean that's the type of stone it was at the present time when this was written. So um, very good point to point out that that could be an antelope. All right, so um, I'll finish verse 35 that someone else can read through 36. Um, unless you guys want me to just keep reading and explaining so we can get through. Um, we're on a little roll here. <laughs> and Moses right. said to the children of Israel, see, Yahuwah has called by name Bezalel, the son of Yori, the son of Hur. Remember, Hur was one of the men holding up, um, um, Aaron and Hur were holding up Moses' hands when they were when they were fighting. And, 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 and every time they helped hold his hands up, the, they would win the battle. When his arms dropped, they would be losing. So Hur was a upstanding man 
of the tribe of Judah. And he is filled him with the spirit of Elohim. So he is an upstanding man working by the Ruach in wisdom and understanding, in knowledge and all manner of workmanship. So when we see Shaul in the letters, you know, in the epistles talking about the wisdom and understanding, he's talking about the wisdom and understanding of Yahuwah, the same as we'll see written here, right? In knowledge, in all manner of workmanship, to design artistic work. So these things can't be done outside of the spirit of Yahuwah, not the way he wants it done. To work in gold and silver and bronze, in cutting jewels for setting in carving wood, and to work in all manner of artistic workmanship. And he has put in his heart the ability to teach, right? Who put who put in the ability to teach? Yah. Put in his heart the ability to teach him and Aholiab. Aholiab is the son of Ab Abishamak. Ab 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 and Aholiab means the father's tent. So we got Aholiab, whose name is the father's tent, helping to build the tent of Yah. Praise Yah. Right? So did, when when uh when Abishamak Ab Ab uh, named his son? Did he know his son would be building the, the, the tabernacle? You know what I mean? You have to think about that in terms of what they named their children and what those names mean. Abimashak and, and, and Aholiab were from the tribe of Dan. He was filled, he has filled them with skill to do all manner of work of the engraver and the designer and the tapestry maker in blue, purple, and scarlet thread, in fine linen, and of the weaver, those who do every work and those who design artistic work. So these men and women of Yah, these children of Israel that were doing the work of the tabernacle and all that entailed were not doing it outside of the spirit of Yah. So you can look at all these extravagant buildings and art around the world that wasn't built by the spirit of Yah. This is what Yah's work looks like, right? When it's done by his people. Very important for us to see that. Um, 36, somebody want to take that or you guys want me to keep reading? I'll help you out, honey. Okay. All right. Sister Diane Rose raised her hand too. So Diane, you can read next, unless you have a question. Uh, I'll be glad to read, but I, I, I do have a comment I'd like to make about um, verse um, 31. Mm -hmm. And he fills him with the spirit of Yahuwah in wisdom, in understanding, and in knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship. I was going to save this for uh, the next chapter, but this is repeated several times. So I'm going to Go ahead and make a comment. Um, when I see this, I think of in the Brit, Ephesians 4 and 11, when it speaks of the fivefold ministry. You know, he gives some teachers, some preachers, some evangelists, um, and he filled them with this gift, you know. He he gives us these gifts he, uh, to for 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 the work of the tabernacle, or for the work of the church, or for the body of Christ, or for the body of Yeshua. Excuse me, my Baptists come out sometimes. <laughs> oh, <yeah>. uh, <laughs> for for the body of Christ. So, um, yeah, it's the spirit of Yahuwah that makes us have these gifts and this is something that we need to it helps us to understand these things because there are a lot of wannabes out there you know that say that they have this thing of you know of their they have this knowledge of their own accord well i went to school i studied this i studied that so i i i know the bible i know what the word says yada yada but unless that Ruach has been placed in there, 
unless the spirit of Yahuwah has been placed in there, then the gift and the ability just isn't there. You know, um, just because a person uh, say that they are a craftsman in something doesn't mean that they're necessarily a good craftsman. It's the difference between somebody just wanting to plant a garden and someone that really has a gift, you know, for gardening uh, per se. So this goes throughout the fact that he gave them the wisdom, the understanding and the knowledge and all manner of things to do what he told them to do. So, um, yeah, and over in the Brit, we read um, in Ephesians 4.11, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Yahusha, and that can roll over into our lives today. Everybody can't do what you do, Brother Rod. Everybody can't do what Sister Robert do. Everyone can't do what I do, you know. And if we grab a hold and recognize, as well as honor um, the gift that our Heavenly Father gives us, then, you know, that is the time that um, it, it comes forth. Praise God. No, no, I think um, you paralleling Ephesians with this is, is exactly the point. Um, I think people, you know, specifically those that have a, a view of scripture that isolates the Brit from the Tanakh are those that separate the understanding that the Ruach has always been here. It's not, it's not new in Acts. You know what I mean? It's not it's not brand new. It didn't just come down. It was indwelling um, and came down on men and women of yachts for the for, for, for the work of the ministry. So, you know, that that idea is, is ludicrous. Um, and, and I appreciate you pulling out the parallels to the giving of the gifts, because that is exactly what Yah is explaining to us right here in this chapter. Um, you know, no, no one person um, can do these things. No person in, within the strength and mind of themselves. That's why it's very important to say the knowledge of Yah, the understanding of Yah, the workmanship of Yah, the designing artistic ability of Yah. <laughs> you know what I mean? These aren't just regular dudes cutting gems. You know what I mean? So... I'll stop there because that that can go a whole nother route. Yeah. But I'm gonna leave Everyone. that one alone. The gym cutting. Um right somebody right. knows what I mean. So <laughs> uh all right, so let's um let's keep reading. Remember, a lot of this we 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 already dissected. He's just giving them and we're actually seeing them doing it. He's calling oh, out the know. names, verse chapter thirty six. And and Bezalel and Ohiliad, Ohiliad, and every gifted artisan in whom Yahuwah had put wisdom and understanding, there it is again, to know how to do all manner. He, he if, if not for him, they wouldn't know how to do what it's saying. For the service of the sanctuary shall do according to all that Yahuwah has commanded. Verse 2. Then Moshe called Bezalel and Ohiliab and every gifted artisan in whose heart Yahuwah had put wisdom, everyone whose heart was stirred to come to do the work. And they received from Moshe all the offering which the children of Israel had brought for the work of in the service, excuse me, the work of the service of making the sanctuary. So they continued bringing to him, free, look, they continued bringing him, him free will offerings every morning then all the craftsmen who were doing all the work of the sanctuary came each from their work he was doing and they spoke to moshe saying <laughs> this is funny the people bring much more than enough for the service of the work which yahuwah commanded so moses gave a commandment and they caused it to be proclaimed throughout the camp saying let neither man nor woman do any more work for the offering of the sanctuary. And the people were restrained from bringing. 
for the material they had was sufficient for all the work to be done. Indeed, too much. So these people's hearts were so willing, they just kept, kept giving. They just kept giving. You know, what is this saying? You know, what is the practical application of that? That those people whose hearts are willing for Yah will continue to give, will continue to give, you know? And this isn't meant to, you know, <laughs> be, you know, keep giving. Come on, break, come on around, drop some more on that plate. Let's have another offering. That's not what this is talking about, okay? And this, and we know that that's abused. Um, we know that these passages are misused, taken out of context, um, but we know what Yah is saying. <laughs> Right? Praise Yah. That's funny, but that's true and sad, right? People are manipulating, you know. People are building castles, you know, to live in. People, you know, you got pastors talking about Yah told him to tell the people to give so he can have a private jet to fly around the country and do ministry, right? Come on, man. You know, so, but but this is, these are the wolves, you know. These are the wolves that are attacking that Yah has warned us again so let's continue reading um then all the gifted artisans oh i'm sorry i i, I told somebody else they can read. all right well all right i'll finish this chapter and then june can read and then um i think i answered she wanted to read um so verse eight then all the gifted artisans among them who worked on the tabernacle made 10 curtains woven of fine linen and of blue, purple, and scarlet thread. With artistic designs of cherubim, they made them. The length of each curtain was 28 cubits, and the width of each curtain, four cubits, and the curtains were all the same size. And he coupled five curtains to one another, and the other five curtains he coupled to one another. He made loops of blue yarn on the edge of the curtain, on the, on the selvage of one set. Likewise, he did on the outer edge of the other curtain of the second set. 50 loops were made on the one curtain and 50 loops he made on the edge of the curtain on the end of the second set. The loops were, were held one curtain to another and he made 50 clasps of gold and coupled the, the curtains to one another with clasps that it might be be one tabernacle, right? Verse 14, he made curtains of goat's hair for the tent over the tabernacle. You guys remember when we discussed this in previous chapters. He made 11 curtains. The length of each curtain was 30 cubits, and the width of each curtain was four cubits. The 11 curtains were the same size. He coupled five curtains by themselves, in six curtains by themselves, and he made 50 loops on the edge of the curtain that is outermost in one set. So the outer curtains um, he's talking about here. And 50 loops he made on the edge of the curtains in the second set. And 50 he made bronze claps, clasps to couple the tents to tent together that it might be one. Then he made a covering for the tent of ram skins dyed red and a covering of badger skins or um, elk skins or uh, whatever it was uh, above that, right? For the tabernacle, he made boards of acacia wood standing upright. The length of each board was 10 cubits and the width of each board a cubit and a half. Each board had two tenons for binding one to another. Then he made for all the boards of the tabernacle. Uh, th excuse me, thus he made for all the boards of the tabernacle. And he made boards for the tabernacle, 20 boards for the south side, 40 sockets of silver he made to go under the 20 boards two sockets under each of the boards for its two tenants. And for the other side of the tabernacle, the north side, he made 20 boards and there 40 sockets of silver, two sockets under each of the, of the boards. For the west side of the tabernacle, he made six boards 
He also made two boards for the back corners of the tabernacle, and they were coupled at the bottom and coupled together at the top by one ring. Thus he made both of them with two corners. So there were eight boards and their sockets, 16 sockets of silver, two sockets under each of the boards. Verse 31, and he made bars of acacia wood, five for the boards on one side of the tabernacle, five for the five bars for the boards on the other side of the tabernacle, and five bars for the boards of the tabernacle on the far side westward. And he made the middle bar to pass through the boards from one end to the other. He overlaid the boards with gold, made their rings of gold to be holders for the bars and laid the bars with gold. Then he made a veil of blue, purple and scarlet thread and fine woven linen. It was work with an artistic design of cherub. He made for it four pillars of acacia wood and overlaid them with gold and their hooks of gold and he cast four sockets of silver for them. He also made a screen for the tabernacle door of blue, purple, and scarlet thread and fine woven linen made by a weaver and its five pillars with their hooks. And he overlaid the capitals with their rings with gold, but their five sockets were bronze. Man, so we see um, the intricate details of the curtains and the rings and the in the in the and the rods and all of the things that went into what we discussed prior and what they meant, so we can understand the visual picture of what's what's happening here in the building, the building of the tabernacle. Praise God. Um, any questions, Sister Diane? Yeah, that's amazing. Um, our Yah is a Yah of order. And it's just amazing when you think of all of these things, the explicity, you know, of the building of the, of the tabernacle, um, how long and of they were to be and what they were to be made of and where they were to go, you know, the, the type of material, all of this. And not only that, but, you know, he gave the craftsman his spirit to be able to do these things. He's awesome. He's awesome. He's awesome. And and um, another thing, Brother Ra, you were speaking of um, in the first uh, seven verses, you think about all of the offerings that they gave in that when they left Egypt, we know that um, they they said to the Egyptians, give me your stuff, you know. <laughs> you know, I'm really putting it in layman's terms here. But, you know, um, give me your give me your gold, give me your silver uh, and, and your fine linen and all of this. And um, that's what they did, you know, without reluctance. Uh, that's what they did because um, Yahuwah obviously had readied them. He readied, um, I'm sure I'm going to find some alatahs if I go back there and look at that, but he readied them to uh, give up all of this, you know, all of their goods and gifts and go. So when it was time for them to make their offerings towards the tabernacle they didn't hoard you know they were not selfish they gave and they gave willingly so you know we can see a connection with that um a, a lot of these um offerings were given to them you know y'all knew what he was doing you know they they were given to them because um, um uh, the israelites the hebrews were poor you know, as far as we know, you know, in Egypt, they probably had some things, but you know, and I, that's just conjecture. I really don't want to go there, but I would think they were, you know, but then they definitely were not poor when they left uh, because they were given all these things. So um, that's something to think about as well. As we are given, we are also to give. And this is exactly what they did. They had so much gold 
and of otherwise uh, to give towards the work of the tabernacle. Praise y'all. Yeah, praise y'all. And I, I think it's also interesting and or I should say important to note that one of the things that, that Yah was trying to also make clear to them because he mentions it so many times is don't do things like their surrounding nations. You know, don't worship like the surrounding nations. Also, don't build like surrounding nations. Remember, when they had the opportunity, they took this same gold that was meant for the tabernacle and they built a golden calf. Like their neighboring um, um, idol worshipers, right? They did what they thought was, that they did what they saw. They did what he did. He's saying, take it and do it this way. And the hearts of the people, when you see the hearts of the people here, you also see a changing of their heart from what it was when Moshe was up on the mountain and they went haywire. So interesting to note that as well. Um, June and then uh, Poppy. I liked what Sister Diane brought out and it reminded me in the book of Acts when the people uh, all got together and gave to a collective for, for a collective purpose. And it kind of reminded me, you know, in this case, obviously supplying the needs to build the tabernacle. And I guess in Acts, it was to make sure everyone's needs was met. Right. Yeah. Do you remember people were, people had traveled to Jerusalem for the feasts. That's what they were there for. And a lot of them decided they were going to stay. They weren't going back to where they came from. So they didn't have anything. And all things became common. It's very important that that we see that there. Um, they were given to people that had nothing. Um, but yeah, I, I can see the connection there. Good, good passage. Um, Sister Poppy. I don't know if my question's appropriate or not, um, but my understanding was that when they um, came out of Mitzrayim, they would have been like, or they were poor, they were walking on foot, but then you hear all these things that they're contributing and they have obviously hauled out of Mitzrayim with them. They had to have had things to carry them, right? Like some sort of wagons and I was, or something, whatever the time period was, because like making columns with acacia wood, I can't imagine it's trying, you know, fleeing Mitzrayim with columns worth of acacia wood on your back. So do you have any historical understanding of that? Well, the, 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 the gold is what they took from, the gold and the silver and the bronze is what they got from the Egyptians. Um, <clears throat> I would think that the, the, the area that they lived in would have had this, this wood um, that they could accumulate. Um, it's quite possible that they did take it to, from Egypt, but if they did, then they would have had provision to carry it. Remember, they took cattle as well, so they had, you know, ways of, of transporting it. Um, but historically, um, I haven't looked into where they got the acacia wood, but um, I would think that it was a tree, you know, in that area that they used um, to... Uh, you know, for the purpose of building the tabernacle. But we can look into the, uh, brother Danny might know. What's up, brother? What you got? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Sabat Shalom. Brother, I, I've been, uh, I've been following up the, the issue of the heart here uh, from the reading of chapter 35. Uh -huh. I, I already see the issue of the heart, you know. Verse 10 says about all the wise hearted uh, verse 10, chapter 35, and uh, in 25 of chapter 35, and all the wise-hearted women. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm tracking the, the issue of the heart here, and uh, even those uh, whom the Ruach has stirred up, you know, verse 34 of verse 35, and he also has put in his heart the ability to teach. So again, the heart for me here is something that is very very critical you know 
and uh, moving on to 36 uh, I, I also see here in verse uh, uh, in verse uh, here in this verse you know uh, wherein the people give out of the overflowing of their heart uh, giving up their silver and gold and so on and so forth because the, the, the it's, it's the opposite to what is happening now because people are hoarding people are keeping silver and gold because their heart is not in tune with Yahuwah so for me here uh, heart is very is the, is the is the matter of all these things with the heart when the heart is in tune to Yahuwah when the heart is fully committed to Yahuwah and of course uh, I also see here that the one who also stirs up is really Yahu the, the, the Ruach this here uh, stirring up all of this all of these things so uh, for me uh, in verse 8 of chapter 34 the wise hearted one so again uh, the matters of the heart here is uh, very important so uh, I think that's what I can share here absolutely the, the, the heart is willing because it's being led by the Ruach you know um, we may think we're good you know we may think we do good things outside of Yah, but we actually don't, <laughs> you know, um, not the way he sees things. So it's, 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 it's interesting. I was, um, I was reading through Joshua last week and I was looking at Rahab and I was, I was looking at how people misinterpret what she, what she did. And they, they assume that the passage is talking about it's okay to lie in this case but the point wasn't that it was that she was serving or was willing to serve a yah that she heard about she was only doing what she knew how and in her mind in her heart protecting those men meant that she had to lie about it to save them to preserve them so yah used somebody that didn't know his will didn't know his ways didn't know his his law, you know, to preserve the life of the two spies. And we have to make sure that we look at all things that way. Outside of Yah, we do things that are right in our own eyes. But with him, we have that perfect understanding of what righteousness is. And that's how he draws us closer to him. And he wants us to look at the law as a mirror of what his righteousness is. These are the qualities, these are the characteristics that one has that follows him, that trusts him, that believes in him. That's why when you get to um, the Brit and, and Yahushua is talking to the, 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 the Yahudin and he's telling them, you're, you're, you're rejecting me, but the, the prostitutes and the tax collectors, they trust me and they don't even know my Torah. Why? They believe something. They believe in me. They have trust in me just upon my reputation. Remember the woman said, you know, she just heard about him. If I can just touch his Zizi, you know, you know, the, 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 the centurion said, look, I'm a, I'm a Roman centurion, but I heard about you. If you just say the word, you know, my family will be healed. You understand what I'm saying? The faith that one has understanding Yah's righteousness um, is what leads all men to him. So we are to be the picture of that. We are to be the light. But when we're not, he still finds another way. Yahushua said he was coming for the lost sheep of Israel. But all these Gentiles came to him. Why? Because it was him. It was him that we see. He wanted Judah to be the light to the world. He wanted the Israelites to be the light to the world. But if they weren't going to be the light that shined his reflection, then he was going to shine his own reflection and all people will be drawn unto him. So we got to keep that in mind. We were talking about gifts earlier. You know, we got to be in tune with what our gifts are. You know, understanding where Yah has us in the kingdom, in his kingdom, what he wants to do with us specifically. You know, where are our strengths? Where are our weaknesses? You know, what is he cultivating? You know, there are people that, that in our fellowship that, that have 
the gift of teaching, but it just needs to be cultivated. And if you jump out ahead of your cultivation, you're not teaching what Yah has you to teach. So you got to be careful with even the gifts that you know you have. Yah has his own timing with you. And it's something specific he wants to do with you. You know, you can you can have the gift of teaching, but, you know, wait and see what Yah is going to do with you. Wait and see how he's going to grow you. Don't forsake the assembling of the saints. You know, how, that's how you learn. That's how you come to the understanding. You know, as we go through the scriptures together, you see things become revealed to you. You know, you're not sitting on an island listening to videos staring you in the wrong way, you know. And, you know, we got to be careful of that because that's happening. You know, that's a real thing, you know. So um, let's be diligent. Let's be mindful of these things and let's stay on on point. You know, Yah is always, always warning us, you know, of our weaknesses and our pitfalls and snares. Something that will, will ensnare you, trap you, you know, lead you to your death. You know, a snare is something that's left for animals that you're trying to catch. To do what? Kill them and eat them. You know, we don't want to be killed and eaten. <laughs> Literally. Right. So praise Yah. Let's stay diligent. Pray, Let's pray for one another in that way, because last and evil days, there are going to be things that sound good, you know, that have that beautiful wrapping, you know, that look good, might even taste good, you know, but it's poison, you know, and we got to be mindful and watchful for those things. Praise God. All right. So we're in... Um, Chapter 37, uh, what time is it? All right. Um, you want to read 37 or you want me to keep reading? I'll help you out. All right, chapter 37. And earlier I had asked you, uh, you know, why is this being repeated? You know, like it was already said in earlier verses or earlier chapters. And I like how you said there's a record of what Yah told Moshe. And then now this record is what he then told the people. Um, and so I guess he was pretty on point with relaying everything that he got. But, all right. Uh, Exodus chapter 37, and Betzalel made the ark of Asaiah wood two and a half cubits long and a cubit and a half wide and a cubit and a half high. And he overlaid it with clean gold inside and out and made a molding of gold all around it. And he cast four rings of gold for it, for its four feet, two rings on its one side and two rings on its other side. And he made poles of our, see, our, say that word for me, honey. Acacia. 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 Acacia wood and overlaid them with gold. And he put the poles into the rings at the sides of the ark to lift the ark. And he made a lid of atonement of clean gold, two and a half cubits long and a cubit and a half wide. And he made two cherubim of beaten gold. He made them from the two ends of the lid of atonement. One cherub at one end on this side and the other cherub at the other end on that side. He made the cherubim from the lid of atonement from the two ends. And the cherubim spread out their wings. Oh, it's, so that's cherubim in Hebrew, I guess. Their wings above and covered the lid of atonement with their wings, with their faces toward each other. And the faces of the cherubim were turned toward the lid of atonement. And he made the table of, I forgot already, axia wood, two cubits long and a cubit wide and a cubit and a half high. And he overlaid it with clean gold and made a molding of gold all around it. And he made a rim of a hand breadth all around it. 
and made a molding of gold for the rim all around it. And he cast four rings of gold for it and put the rings on the four corners that were its four legs. The rings were next to the rim as holders for the poles to lift the table. And he made the poles of acacia wood to lift the table and overlaid them with gold. And he made the utensils which were on the table, its dishes and its cups and its bowls and its jars for pouring of clean gold. And he made the lampstand of clean gold. He made the lampstand of beaten work, its base and its shaft, its cups, its ornamental knobs, and its blossoms were from it. And six branches came out of its sides, three branches of the lampstand out of the one side and three branches of the lampstand out the other side. There were three cups like almond flowers on one branch with ornamental knob and blossom and three cups like almond flowers on the other branch, a knob and a blossom. So for the six branches coming out of the lampstand. And on the lampstand were four cups like almond flowers, its knobs and blossoms and a knob under the first two branches of the same, and a knob under the second two branches of the same, and a knob under the third two branches of the same, for the six branches coming out of it. Their knobs and their branches were of it. All of it were one beaten work of clean gold. And he made its seven lamps and its snuffers and its trays of clean gold. And he made it of a talent of clean gold and all of its utensils. And he made the incense slaughter place of axia ac wood, a cubit long and a cubit wide, square and two cubits high. Its horns were of it. And he overlaid it with clean gold, its top and its sides all around and its horns. And he made a molding for it of gold all around. And he made two rings of gold for it under its molding and its two corners on both sides as holders for the poles which to lift it. And he made the poles of axia wood and overlaid them with gold. And he made the set apart anointing oil and the clean incense of sweet spices according to the work of the uh, perfumer. Great job, so we see <clears throat> um, the intricacies of, of the, the lampstand, the, the table of showbread, the Ark of the Testimony, the Ark of the Covenant, the incense altar, and the oil of incense. So all of these things, and <laughs> each person that was doing it was specifically guided by the Ruach, was specifically sanctioned by Yah, the, even the perfumer, you know? So, man, um, and, you know, those, those of you that weren't here, then we went through these things in intricate detail between Exodus 20 and Exodus 30, where all of these things were, were initiated by Yah to Moshe. So we're just reading again, um, the actual um, instruction from Moshe to the people. Um, and they're, they're gonna build, uh, this this uh, tabernacle and everything that goes in it. Chapter 38, who wants to take that? If not, I will. All right, I'll, okay, Sister Robbie. How far in chapter 38 you want me to read, Elder Rod? Um, as far as you feel comfortable, I, um, okay, okay, you can read the whole yeah. chapter if you want. Remember, we're we're okay. just going through these chapters oh, okay. because they're rep repetitive to us, but we want okay. we don't want to miss anything. We want to read through everything. Okay. okay, sounds good. Okay, and it reads, and he went on to make the altar burnt offering out to out of acacia wood. Five cubits was its length, and five cubits its width. It being four square and three cubits was its height. 
Then he made its horns upon its four corners. Its horns proceeded out of it. Next, he overlaid it with copper. After that, he made all the utensils of the altar, the cans and the shovels and the bowls, the forks and the fire holders. All its utensils he made of copper. He further made for the altar a grating, a network of copper under its rim, down toward its center. Then he cast four rings on the four extremities near the grating of copper as supports for the poles. After that, he made the poles of acacia wood and overlaid them with copper. Then he put the poles into the rings on the sides of the altar for carrying it with them. He made it a hollow chest of planks. Then he made the basin of copper and its stand of copper by the use of the mirrors of the women servants who did organized service at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And he proceeded to make the courtyard for the side toward the Negev to the south, the hangings of the courtyard were of fine twisted linen for a hundred cubits. Their 20 pillars and their 20 socket pedestals were of copper. The pegs of the pillars and their joints were of silver. Also for the north side, there were a hundred cubits. Their 20 pillars and their 20 socket pedestals were of copper. The pegs of the pillars and their joints were of silver. But for the west side of the hangings were for 50 cubits. Their pillars were 10 and their socket pedestals 10. The pegs of the pillars and their joints were of silver. And for the east side toward the sun rising, there were 50 cubits. The hangings were for 15 cubits to the one wing. Their pillars were three and their socket pedestals three. And for the other wing on this as well as that side of the gate of the courtyard, the hangings were for 15 cubits. Their pillars were three and their socket pedestals three. All the hangings of the courtyard round about were of fine twisted linen and the socket pedestals for the pillars were of copper. The pegs of the pillars and their joints were of silver and the overlaying of their tops was of silver and there were silver joinings for all the pillars of the courtyard. And the screens of the gate of the courtyard was the work of a weaver a blue thread and wool dyed reddish purple and caucus scarlet material and fine twisted linen. And 20 cubits was the length and the height throughout its extent was five cubits equally with the hangings of the courtyard. And their four pillars and their four socket pedestals were of copper. Their pegs were of silver and the overlaying of their heads and their joints were of silver. And all the tent pins for the tabernacle and for the courtyard round about were of copper. The following are the things inventoried of the tabernacle, the tabernacle of the testimony, which was inventoried at the command of Moshe as the service of the Levites under the guidance of Ithamar, the son of Aaron, the priest, and Bethel, the son of Uri, the son of her of the tribe of Judah did all that Yahuwah had commanded Moshe. And with him was Oholiab and the son of Ahishamach of the tribe of Dan, a craftsman and embroiderer and weaver in the blue thread and the wool dyed reddish purple and caucus scarlet material and fine linen. All the gold that was used for the work in all the work of the holy place came to the amount of the gold of the wave offering, 29 talents and 730 shekels by the shekel of the holy place. And the silver of the ones registered of the assembly was a hundred 
talents and 1,775 shekels by the shekel of the holy place. The half shekel for an individual was the half of a shekel by the shekel of the holy place. For every man who was passing over to those who were registered from 20 years of age and upward, amounting to 603,550. And a hundred talents of silver went into the casting of the socket pedestal of the holy place and the socket pedestal of the curtain. A hundred socket pedestals equaled a hundred talents, a talent to a socket pedestal. And out of the 1,775 shekels, he made pegs for the pillars and overlaid their tops and joined them together. And the copper of the wave offering was 70 talents and 2,400 shekels. And with this, he proceeded to make the socket pedestals of the entrance of the tent of meeting and the copper altar and the copper grating that belonged to it and all the utensils of the altar and the socket pedestals of the courtyard roundabout and the socket pedestals of the gate of the courtyard and all the tent pins of the tabernacle and all the tent pins of the courtyard round about. Praise God. <laughs> this is literally yeah. like reading mm -hmm. instructions. We're reading instructions, but just think of you putting an Ikea dresser together mm -hmm. or Ikea bed or something. You're literally mm -hmm. reading it, you know, um, and, you know, <clears throat> how Yah makes things clear, you know, without mm -hmm. question, piece by piece by piece, you know. Um, <laughs> you know, you always say, if you got pieces left over at the end, uh, you missed something. <laughs> Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Something's going to fall apart. But um, mm -hmm. we got 10 minutes, so we, we could have a short discussion afterwards. I want to breeze through chapter 39, and then we can do chapter 40 next week. Um, chapter 39, of the blue, purple, and scarlet thread, they make garments of ministry for ministering in the holy place and made the holy garments of Aaron as Yahuwah had commanded Moshe. He made the ephod of gold. Remember, this is the vest of the, 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 the uh, uh, Levites are wearing of, of gold, blue, purple, scarlet thread, fine linen. And they beat the gold into thin sheets and cut it into threads to work it in with the blue, purple, and the scarlet thread, the fine linen, into artistic designs. They made shoulder straps for it to couple, <clears throat> excuse me, for it to couple, to couple it together. It was coupled together in its two edges, at its two edges, and the intricately woven band of his ephod was on it was the same workmanship woven of gold, blue, purple, scarlet thread, and a fine woven linen. And Yahuwah, uh, that, uh, as, as Yahuwah had commanded Moshe. And they set onyx stones enclosed in settings of gold. They were engraved in singlets as singlets are engraved with the names of the sons of Israel. He put them on the shoulders of the ephod as memorial stones for the sons of Israel. So Yahuwah, uh, as Yahuwah had commanded Moshe. So they would know who the sons are. They would know the bloodline, right? The breastplates. And he made the breastplate artistically woven like the workmanship of the ephod of gold, blue, scarlet thread and fine line. Also, this reminds me when we see carpenter in, in the New Testament, when it speaks of Joseph and Yahushua being the carpenter's son, it's really should be translated craftsman. So it begs to differ that he wasn't just a, a, a carpenter. He was a craftsman. He was working for Yah. He was building things for Yah, maybe working in the tabernacle, maybe working in the temples, who knows, but he was a craftsman. I think that's 
that word is cheapened a little bit when it comes to our savior, right? Then made the breastplate square, verse nine, by doubling it, a pan, and with its length and a span uh, with when doubled. And they set, they set it in four rows of stone, a row with sardius, a topaz, an emerald for the first row. For the second row, a turquoise, a sapphire, and a diamond. The third row, a zacinth, a jacinth rather, and, and a gate, and an am, amethyst, amethyst. The fourth row, a beryl, an onyx, and a jasper. They were, they were enclosed in settings of gold in their mountings. They were 12 stones according to the names of the sons of Israel, according to their names engraved like a signet, each one with its own name according to the 12 tribes. And they made chains for the breastplate at the ends like braided cords of pure gold. They also made two settings of gold and two gold rings and put two rings on the two ends of the breastplate. And they put the two braided chains of gold in the two rings on the ends of the breastplate. The two ends of the two braided chains they fastened in the two settings and put them on the shoulder straps of the ephod in the front. And they made two rings of gold and put them on the two ends of the breastplate on the edge of it, which was on the inward side of the ephod. They made two other gold rings and put them on the two shoulder straps underneath uh, the ephod toward its front, right at the seam above the intricately woven band of the ephod. And they bound the breastplate by means of its two rings to the rings of the ephod with blue cord so, th so that it could be above the intricately woven band of the ephod and that the breastplate would not come loose from the ephod as Yahuwah had commanded Moshe. So he's telling them what to put and he's telling them why they're putting it there, right? Great, great, great instructions, right? All of Yah's instructions are great, right? If we follow them. Um, the priestly garments. He made the robe of the ephod woven work all of blue and there was an opening in the middle of the robe like the opening in a coat of mail with a woven binding all around the opening so that it would not tear right they made on them verse 24 on the hem of the robe pomegranates of blue purple and scarlet and a fine woven linen and they made them bells of pure gold and put the bells between the pomegranates on the hem of the robe all around between the garments. Remember, you wanted to hear those bells walking around inside the Holy of Holies, because if you didn't, something was wrong, <laughs> right? So those bells were for many different reasons, right? A bell and a pomegranate around the hem of the robe to minister as Yahuwah had commanded Moshe. They made tunics, artistically woven of fine linen for Aaron and his sons, a turban of fine linen, exquisite hats of fine linen, short trousers of fine woven linen, and a sash of fine woven linen with blue, purple, and scarlet thread, made by a weaver, as Yahuwah had commanded. Then they made the plate of the set-apart crown of pure gold and wrote on it an inscription like the engraving of the signet, set apart to Yahuwah, holiness to Yahuwah. Um, they, tied, they tied to it a blue cord to fasten it above the turban as Yahuwah had commanded. Verse 32, thus all the work of the tabernacle of the tent of the meeting was finished, amen. They finished it. And the children of Israel did according to all that Yahuwah had commanded Moshe. So they did. And they brought the tabernacle to Moses, the tent of all the tent and all the furnishings, its clasps, 
its boards, its bars, its pillars, its sockets, the covering of the ram skins dyed in red, the covering of the badger skins and the veil of the covering, the ark of the testimony with its poles and mercy seat, the table, all of its utensils and the showbread, the pure gold, the lampstand and its lamps, the lamps set in order, all its utensils and the oil for light, the gold altar, the anointing oil and the sweet incense, the screen for the tabernacle door, the bronze altar, its gate of bronze, its poles and all its utensils, the laver with its base, the hangings of, of the court, its pillars and its sockets, the screen for the court gate, its cords and its pegs, all the utensils for the service of the tabernacle for the tent of the meeting and the garments of ministry to minister to the set apart place, the set apart garments for Aaron, the priest and his sons, garments to minister to the priest. According to all that Yahuwah had commanded Moshe, so the children of Israel did all the work. Then Moshe looked over all the work and indeed they had done it as Yahuwah had commanded just so they just so they had done it um and Moshe blessed them praise you man man so we got through it um we'll isolate chapter 40 because now you know what we read so far um, in these last four chapters, all had to do with the instructions that we already saw. What we're going to see in chapter 40 is something different because it's actually a, the erecting of the tabernacle. So we'll go through that um, in detail next week. And, uh, you know, of course, in two weeks we'll be, y'all willing, in Leviticus, the book of Leviticus. So we got one more chapter to go in the book of Exodus. It's been a beautiful journey and I'm excited for what's to come. So praise Yah and uh, Shabbat Shalom. Shalom, Akuti and Rohim. Thank you so much for viewing this video. We hope it was helpful to your walk in the truth. Remember to always search the scriptures on your own to study Abba's word and show yourself approved according to 2 Timothy 2.15. We invite you to study with us. To join us in a live study, just go to our website at assemblyofyahuwah.com and click the Join Us tab. We have something available Wednesday through Saturday of every week. If you've been Baruch or blessed by this video today or any other study, we encourage you to go to the giving tab on our website. Our elders all have their own ways of income, so none of the giving or proceeds go to them. Instead, it goes to biblical assembly needs. We also encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you don't miss any new videos. We sincerely pray that Abba continues to direct your path as you acknowledge Him in all your ways. Much avaha and again shalom.